John was like, hey bud, I'm gonna uh, throw this party and uh, I want you to come by and like talk about neuroscience. And I said, oh, do, do you, you want people to show up? Uh, so it isn't as bad as it sounds. We're gonna talk about some real basics. And uh, really the point of this is to help you understand how the brain operates, um, how people remember, how to recall data, and how to essentially cheat when it comes to staying top of mind. Now, uh, everybody in here has a brand to some extent, yes, right? Like, so you can, that whole rigmarole around the word brand, which is becoming a lot like the word green, by the way. But yeah, it's either you as a salesperson or it's your organization. So whatever context you have, just think about that as being your brand for the sake of this presentation. Fair enough? Sure. All right, so um, yeah, uh, a little bit on me. Uh, I had basically no idea what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a lawyer, and then I started working in law, and then I was like, oh, this is sort of terrible, and uh, bailed on that whole thing. I uh, was a mergers and acquisitions analyst for about a decade. And while I was there, I uh, discovered something very fascinating. And that, has anybody in here ever bought or sold a business, by the way? That's a, yeah? yeah. All right, so here are the stats. Let's say you want to go buy a company. And so what do you do? Well, you look at all the numbers, you look at the balance sheet and the P&L and the inventory list and, and all those things. The probability that you, as a very smart person, running that organization into the ground in only three years is 70%. Let's say that you already operate a business and you're buying a business in the same business that you already know. It's still 70%. So how do you explain that? So I spent three years studying that and uh, that's what I built my company around. And, it, and the reason is, does anybody have a guess what the reason is? I actually figured it out. John? I'll just keep quiet. Does anybody have a guess? Culture, culture kind of. We started with leadership, culture. Something else. What? Lack of revenue. Ah, anybody that says they're undercapitalized, that's a chump. That's a chump excuse. Combining the brands? Like, how do you combine the two brands? Yeah, kind of. And there's something specific about that. There's a fundamental disconnect that exists between why you perceive people do business with you and why you perceive people do business with the company that you're acquiring and the actual reason that they're doing business with you. Seems crazy, right? Like... But here, imagine you go and talk to, you're going to buy somebody's company and you come in, you're going to go talk to them and you say, tell me why you're successful. And they're going to tell you all the things. Here's the problem. They have absolutely no perspective on the reason that they're successful. They're completely biased as to the processes they've created, internal systems, the products they have, right? So imagine you're a coffee company. We have these beans and these beans grow at this certain, you know, where the hell do they grow coffee? In Colombia, it's a mountain and like there's like a dew point. And we have to get them at this. Is that why people buy those? Buy that coffee? We really don't know, but that's our perceived competitive advantage. So when you come in and you buy a company, you make changes, you make certain assumptions. And without realizing it, you change the competitive advantage or the reason that that organization is successful without even knowing it. And then you start losing customers. And then you start panicking. And the next thing you know, the business is insolvent. There is a 70% probability the story I just told you will happen no matter what business you're in. Manufacturing, distribution, sales, it doesn't matter. So that's what we studied for lots of years. What I'm going to share with you today are some of the byproducts that we learned about how the brain operates and, and how you can not only understand um, how people perceive your organization, but how you can take advantage of how the mind works in order to stay top of mind. Only if you like money. If you don't like money, this whole thing does not apply to you. Fair enough? Okay. Um, question. So I want everybody, you don't have to say it out loud unless you really want to, but just think about this, okay? Because it's going to change by the end of this presentation. Or if you want to write it down, write it down. You're going to be frustrated because it's going to be wrong. We actually started measuring this. We've been measuring this for eight years. How many people think the reason that's in their head right now is actually correct? Thank you for being brave. And I know people are afraid to put their hand up. Who thinks they know the actual percentage, the probability of you being correct? I'm going to tell you, you're not going to believe me. I know because I present to CEOs all the time and they're like, I don't believe you. 
It's 1.7%. Basically, one out of 100. It seems insane, right? It's reality. If you don't understand why people give you money, you don't know anything. So keep that in mind. All right, we're going to play a game. Probably tough to see from back there, so I'm going to say these out loud. Now, I'm going to give you an idea, and then you have to tell me what company I'm talking about. Fair enough? So if I say online search, the company I'm talking about is? Google. All right. Correct. Expensive coffee. Starbucks. Greeting cards. Hallmark. Big burrito. Doing well so far. Low prices. Walmart. Online auction. eBay. Expensive watch. Rolex. Online books. Amazon. All right. Soft drink. Coke. Jeans. <laughs> Affordable airline. Southwest. Fried chicken. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so. Who can tell me what strange thing just happened? Our subconscious knows. Something even crazier than that. <laughs> we named all of those off of what the, the, name, the name. Did anybody hear a single different idea? Did anybody say one brand that was different? She said Popeyes. What'd you say? Popeyes. You said Popeyes? <laughs> So you would be correct, but I didn't say most delicious. OK, so with one exception. Does anybody know the statistical probability of that happening? I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with schmiro. <laughs> so how did that happen? Are these taglines? Are these advertisements? They're just ideas. They're concepts. They're simple ideas. And a lot of these organizations do many, many things. They're ginormous brands. But you still just, everybody's, but everybody got that one thing. So for instance, Southwest, they haven't been the most affordable airline for over a decade. <laughs> so let me ask you this. What the hell is wrong with all of your brains? Is reality reality? Is truth reality? Are facts reality? Perception. Perception. Anybody that tells you otherwise does not understand business. I want everybody in this room to think about a competitor or someone that they dislike greatly. <laughs> and think about the things you say about those people. They're incompetent. They can't even execute. They can't even do X. Then how come they're kicking ass? Grant, are you suggesting that you can be completely incapable of doing a project or a job well and be wildly successful? That's exactly what I'm telling you. Some of the most incapable, incompetent people in this world are wildly, wildly successful because they did what these guys did. And I'm gonna teach you how to do it, okay? Now the first thing you need to know is that these are great, great big brands, but they stand for one simple thing. One simple thing inside of, of your head. Guess what happens if you try and stand for two things inside someone's head? You might as well be zero. Let's try it. We'll show the math on that a little bit later, I think. This is an annotated version of a longer presentation. So let's talk about how the brain naturally operates. You got to understand this dude. His name is Jean Piaget, male model. He's an epistemologist. <laughs> and epistemology, apparently, is uh, the, uh, the study of knowledge, which I can't believe is actually a job. But it is. And what John Piaget did, if you've read a book on like, if you've taken like Psychology 101, 
You've talked about this guy before. What he did essentially was he stole a bunch of ideas from uh, very smart philosophers, uh, in particular um, Immanuel Kant. And then he applied a little bit of what we understood about science at that time to uh, Immanuel Kant's ideas. And then he kind of ran with them. And I'm glad he did. Uh, so one of the things that he really talked about is the idea of a schema. Now a schema is something uh, that is uh, uh, that your mind will simplify in order to create efficiency. So I'm sure many of you, uh, when you're sober, completely sober, when you drive home from work or something, you'll be like, oh, I'm home. Apparently I took a left here and I took a right there and I went through a light, but you don't remember it, right? It's because your brain creates these schemas in order to free up your brain to do other stuff. Your brain does the same thing around life experiences, and around uh, uh, recall. And then your brain also has these things called schematic markers. Now schematic markers are, uh, uh, imagine if you will, like uh, the timeline of the United States, okay? Like if it was saw it on a, on a big wall at a museum or something. There would be like these significant moments. And the significant moments would have like sort of thicker hashes, right? Like, and like less significant moments would have thinner. Hashes. So as for instance, the birth of Abraham Lincoln might be a small hash, but the death of Abraham Lincoln would be like a bigger one. Fair enough. And you guys have these in your life, right? So um, the, your first day of work may be like a meh, but like the time you got a promotion was like a lot bigger or your wedding or the birth of your child. These are very thick schematic markers and your brain will recall a lot of specific data about that event. Now, um, if it's been at least 10 years, 60% of that data is wrong. Let that soak in for a second. Do you guys know that? If that doesn't horrify you, it should. 60% of the details of any major memory that was been 10 years ago is actually incorrect. Like where you were, who you were with, what you did. Anyway, um, I just hope like I was at my wedding. I know I was there. We have photographic evidence. There's at least a 40% chance I was there. Um, and uh, so understanding a schematic marker is important because your, uh, a schematic marker is a way that your brain creates visceral recall. So as an individual, as a business owner, as a salesperson, you want to be a schematic marker. You want to do everything you can to be a schematic marker and to create a schema inside people's heads because that is what just happened at the beginning of this. These brands have created schematic markers and schemas inside of your brain. That's why you are able to easily recall them. Fair enough? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. How does this work? It works almost identical to how uh, a file cabinet works. Now, a file cabinet is a big metal box. Uh, so, <laughs> so imagine you uh, grab a file cabinet and you open it. Where do your eyes immediately go? The tabs, exactly right. What, what types of things are written on the tabs of a file folder? Subject. Like what? Name of an account. Name of an account, what else? Accounting. Ac accounting, okay, sure. Dates, PR. names. Uh, now, what's interesting, now let's say that you sat at somebody else's desk, right? Even a different company, and you open their file cabinet, would it be easy or difficult to figure out what was going on? Yes. Should be really easy, right? And the reason is because the things that we write on tabs are things that are objective. Who knows what objective means? Love objective. Love objective. <laughs> Does anybody know what objective means? Black and white. Means Black and white. It lacks subjectivity. It lacks subjectivity. <laughs> objective means it's the same in everybody's head. A date is the same in everybody's head. A name is the same in everybody's head. A company name is the same in everybody's head. But the idea of, let's say, a value proposition, like cheap. Is cheap the same in everybody's head? What about quality? Who uses the word quality in their pitch or in their marketing materials? I appreciate those of you that are too scared to raise your hand. It is one of the worst words you could possibly put into what you do. Who knows why? Ben does. Because it's subjective and it actually means nothing. What about something like Paramount? These are called generic words. Your mind literally casts them away into the ethos. 
It's looking for an objective word. So uh, rule, objective good, subjective bad. If you use subjective language in your pitch, in your marketing materials, or in your communication, you are failing miserably. You are quite literally saying things to people that they will never remember. So use objective language. Rule number one. Okay? Now, let's talk about emotions. You gotta know about this dude. Antonio Damasio is a neuroscientist and he was doing a study of a bunch of people in, uh, at USC and uh, they had disabled certain parts of their limbic system through head trauma, which means their brain was unable to create things like serotonin, norepinephrine, which, are, which essentially are the chemicals that give us emotions. So if you can imagine a group of people that are just sort of sitting around and like robotically unable to feel things like happiness or sadness or anxiety uh, or humor, right? Uh, they were studying them. And one of the things that he found was that these people were, were in many ways unable to make even basic decisions. And, and even down to, uh, uh, there was a defining moment where they were trying to order breakfast. And what followed he called endless logical deliberation. What do you want for breakfast? Well, yesterday I had fruit. Maybe I want oatmeal. One time I read an article that says, and it would go on and on and on and on, and they wouldn't make a decision. And he said, huh. So we've always believed that we're this highly evolved species because we use a combination of emotion and reason and logic in our decision making. What if that's not true? What if, what if emotion plays a substantially higher role? So they did a bunch of research and guess what they found out? There's a mix. Who knows what that mix is? Who thinks they know? Percentage. What percentage of our decisions originate and exit through our emotive brain versus our logic brain? 80. 90. 90. 80. 85. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. um, what, what they found was that the logic sectors of our brain are really just options processors. And they don't, and the, the actual output of the decision, the physio physiologically, our smart brain, our prefrontal cortex and our frontal lobe doesn't even participate. And that's if you're buying highly logical stuff. Your logic brain will feel like it's participating, but as you all know and can remember specific instances, you will ignore logic and reason in order to satisfy your emotions. And sometimes it's a really big give, like you bought a car you really couldn't afford, or sometimes it's little, like you cheated on your diet. But the reality is it doesn't matter what kind of decision you're making, whether you are buying a car, selecting an apartment, where you wanna work, or what you're gonna have for lunch, the decision originates and exits through your emotions. So, are you making an emotional objective argument when you're trying to get someone to buy something from you? If you aren't, guess what you're doing? You're losing money. So let's keep going. Let's talk about a practical application of what this might look like. Let's pick on lawyers. Any lawyers in the room? Yes. <laughs> oh man, this is gonna be painful. All right. So back in the day, uh, there were lawyers and they existed, you know, sort of imagine like pre urbanization lots of small towns and there was like a lawyer in town and guess what he did? All the law. All of the law, you know, choice, right? And then there was one lawyer one day somewhere in a larger town and he said, all we're going to do is divorces. And all the lawyers laughed. Good luck, schmuck. Not going to be able to pay your bills. We only do like four divorces a year. But the human mind, as it's emotionally told to do, gravitates towards specialization in almost every single instance of our decision making imaginable. Why does our brain gravitate towards a specialist? Anybody have an idea? Well, actually, let me start here. Yeah, kind of, but there's a, there's a more, there's a more uh, 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 sort of um, physiological reason. 
Who knows what the brain's job is, really? Our brain really only kind of has one job. Keep us alive. Keep us alive. That's right. You guys know that? That's it. It's like super insulting. It's not like to create something beautiful or like do calculus. Your brain's job is to keep you alive. Realize this is happening to you, by the way, because if you own your own business, staying alive and running a successful business are almost counterintuitive ideas. <laughs> so like, yeah. in many ways, in many ways, you have to like be a crazy person to run a successful business because uh, your brain is kind of telling you uh, that that is not a good idea at all. You should go do what everybody else is doing because that's safe and your brain's job is really just to keep you safe. So, um, so because the brain, so our brain gravitates towards specialization. So the reason we do that is because if we're dealing with a specialist, your brain perceives there to be a higher level of um, quality, right? So let's say we're gravitating towards a, a, a water well, right? Um, your brain wants you to go to a water well that has somebody that is, uh, 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 that's a crappy example. Yeah, that's terrible. That's a terrible example. <laughs> What's a water well? What's a water well? Uh, uh, if it comes to uh, uh, food, oh, oh, here's a good example. So let's say that you ever driven by a town you're not familiar with and there's like two restaurants, maybe you're like on the way to Colorado or something, which one do you, you stop at the one that has a full parking lot or empty parking lot? It makes no sense. Why would you do that? You're supposed to stop at the one that's empty so you can get in. But you don't because your brain is saying, uh, probably safer. Right? No, it's no more simple reason than that. Uh, so um, when you see a divorce attorney versus an attorney and you are getting a divorce, you can't help it. You're kind of like, well, I don't even know why. And you may be like looking and you really like the attorney, but the divorce attorney, you like, may not even like him, but you're like, like they have to know, like the amount of case law they have to know is like this versus this. And so what happened is the divorce attorney took all the divorce clients away from the regular attorneys, right? In many ways, uh, the, the field of law created, in commerce at least, created the idea of specialization. And they're the worst marketing practitioners of it, which is an unbelievably hilarious irony. <laughs> so then there was a guy named Joe, and Joe essentially said, uh, he was a divorce attorney, also a CPA, went through a divorce himself, and he said, I think I'm just gonna create a divorce practice, but I'm only gonna represent men. And all the lawyers laughed. Good luck, schmuck. Why would you unnecessarily limit the number of clients you could potentially take money from by 50%? That's stupid mathematics. And the name of that law firm is? Cordell and Cordell. Does anybody know how Joe Cordell is doing today? <laughs> Never remarried. <laughs> Joe Cordell and his firm has one of the highest turnover rates of any major law firm. They have one of the lowest closing rates of any law firm, which means they lose a lot of clients, right, before they get to settlement or they get to a case which means in many ways, they suck at what they do. Grant, are, are you suggesting that you can suck at your job and become wildly successful? That's exactly what I'm saying. Happens all the time. Happened to Joe. They cash a lot of checks up front. They're actually trained to say something on the first meeting, as soon as they sit down, their lawyers are. And I'm not gonna say it out loud. But if any of you come up to me afterwards and tell me what it is, you're gonna get a high five. It's not nice. I want you to think about a tree. Uh, and the reason for that is because in order to segment and communicate yourself correctly, you need to think like a tree. All industries start out as saplings, essentially. We don't know if they're gonna be successful, uh, I mean, law was, and then it started growing, and as the industry grew, branches started naturally coming off, right? So, uh, and as that happens, what's the first thing to come off before it turns into a branch? It's a, what is the first branch? Seven. It's a leaf, right? So I want you to think for the purposes of this illustration, I want you to think about leaves as being money, okay? So uh, the industry grows, a leaf comes off, and it's like, eh, Okay, well that's good. And then that leaf became divorce law, or that leaf became a whole branch of estate planning law or criminal law. 
And uh, as the industry naturally grew, so did those branches. And all Joe did was create a new limb. That was it. Did Joe have to go back to law school and get a degree in men? I mean, what did he really have to do? All he did was like, if a female called, he'd be like, uh, sorry? And then like get, like get Vanity Fair out of the waiting room and put in men's health. That was it. That's a business model. And then after he was getting established, he advertised the crap out of it, which is a defense mechanism, by the way. Is anybody here advertising? Advertising is a defense mechanism. Advertising's best use is to uh, increase the barrier to entry into whatever it is you're doing, if you do this correctly. If you are not positioned correctly, advertising is forced to become a weapon, which is actually not its best use. But that's a whole other thing. That's a different talk. So here's what I want you to think about. Let's just say for the sake of argument that we are a law firm and we are a divorce law firm. And similar to Cordell and Cordell, we are a divorce law firm for men. Now it's our job to come up with a new, so, far, so by the way, Cordell and Cordell came, was and is currently unbelievably successful by just creating this very simple argument. Let's create a new limb off of divorce law for men. So for those of you that need help with patterns, we see how this works. So we might say, we are a divorce attorney for men who were cheated on. We're cheated on. That's really good. Divorce attorney for men who? Second divorce. Second divorce. Good one. Divorce law for men. Hey, objective. By the way, objective and emotional. Objective and emotional. Great positions. Divorce attorney for men who are homosexual. Emotional, objective. Divorce attorney for men who? Have children, emotional, objective. Divorce attorney for men who? Over the age of 50. Not quite so emotional, but well, maybe, right? But most certainly objective. Net worth over a million dollars. Net worth over a million dollars, if we were pointing to people. What does he say? Oh, it's good. That's really good, right? Well, it has to be objective, bro. Yeah. Yes. See how this works? Do any of these law firms exist? So let's think about how this works. Let's pick one, right? Let's pick, uh, let's pick wealthy men, right? Divorce attorney for men who has a net worth of, say, over $10 million, just for the sake of making it even more. So right now, when I say that, uh, and, and, you're, and now, by the way, our whole existence and our families and our kids' colleges are now reliant on this position. Your brain is now releasing a neurotoxin called norepinephrine because that's crazy and there's not that many people that know someone that has a net worth of $10 million. And your uh, perception of opportunity is predicated on your own life experiences. So let's say that you don't know anybody that has a net worth of over $10 million. In your mind, that opportunity is exactly what? Zero. Does anybody have any guesses as to how many people? I mean, I don't know have a net worth of over $10 million just in Kansas City? Tens of thousands. More clients than we could ever, ever imagine. It's not that scary. So, not only did we just create an incredibly strong, objective, and emotional position that, by the way, repositions a very successful brand because, let's think about how this works. If we exist, that is, a law firm that only works with men that have a lot of money, what does that say about Cordell and Cordell without having to say anything? That's right. What? They're not good at it. If they were good at it, we wouldn't exist. So we have repositioned them as being bad at dealing with wealthy men without having to say a single bad word. Does anybody here use uh, Invest in Google AdWords or SEM marketing? Does anybody know how Google AdWords works for the most part? Okay, so here it's a, it is a, uh, obviously it's an advertising platform where you advertise on Google and here's the way it works. Uh, you buy keywords that are associated with your company and depending on how many other people are bidding on those, that dictates the price. 
So the word lawyer, for instance, is one of the most expensive you can buy. Has a ton, has a, is extremely expensive. So you might spend, you might spend 100 or 150 dollars every time someone clicks on an ad that says attorney if it goes to your website. So are there more people or fewer people that will click on divorce attorney versus attorney? Fewer. Fewer, that's correct. Which means because it's fewer, that means the price goes down. What about divorce attorney for men, more or less? What about divorce attorney for men, $10 million? Less. Less. So when you're well positioned, not only are you creating not a strong objective argument that is emotional, but it's actually cheaper to advertise. It almost doesn't make sense. But that is reality. I'm going to leave you with uh, the hypothalamus. As you do. The hypothalamus is a very powerful part of our brain. It controls lots of stuff, our flight or flight mechanisms. And our hypothalamus, um, while it does, in a, in, a, in a human being, does have a lot of things that, do, that it can do that it doesn't do in other species, a lot of species also have a hypothalamus. Almost all of them, actually, mammals in particular. And we aren't that wildly different from many mammals. And um, has anybody ever watched, like, a, or been flipping through the channels and you see, like, a, a, one of those shows and there's, like, the South African accent guy and he, there's, like, drums and you're, like, watching this and there's, like, gazelles and they're sort of, like, chilling on the plane and you're, like, oh, what are you waiting for? Wow. Right? You're waiting for that. So here's the thing. When they're shooting this, these guys are pretty good hunters. Or the females will actually do some of the hunting, right? And, but it's TV. So what they do is they'll shoot, they'll shoot stuff like way before or like way after. But the camera people are trained to look for specific things. So you have like that poor bastard in a tree or like the guy on like the, the Jeep, you know, driving around and then there's like a helicopter guy maybe or like a drone and they're all watching this gazelle herd. And they are all looking for a very specific moment. What is that moment? Hmm? No, it's too late then. You gotta get it on camera. Who said that? Yup, that's right. It's not when they're running. They are trained to find the stragglers and follow the ones that are um, running away from the herd. Why are they trained to do that? It's the one that gets eaten. So essentially, it's think like a lion. They know that the lion is going to go after that gazelle because the lion has, is genetically predisposed to know that it increases the probability of them eating. So that's what they do. It's safe. It is. So let's think about your business or what you're selling, right? Who you're representing. There's this inherent fear that I was talking about early, earlier about saying the same thing as everybody else actually makes your brain feel more comfortable. There's a reason that you go look at your competitor's websites and you look at their services and you're like, oh man, we should add that. If you do that, your brain actually makes you feel better. But what you must do is the exact opposite. Because if you do the same thing as everybody else, you'll never be at the front of this presentation. No one will ever remember you, ever. You will literally work, if you're a business, you will work a lifestyle business and then you will be done. You will never build a sustainable enterprise. If you want to absolutely crush it, if you're in sales, and make what is colorfully referred to as FU money, you have to do this. Because if you look and smell like every other salesperson, you will be forgotten. Be the gazelle that separates the pack and do the exact opposite of what your brain wants you to do. Because in business, that thing does not exist. 
There is no such thing as a lion in business. The lion is your fear of doing something different. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time. Good is table stakes. Good is irrelevant. Right. Have you ever walked up to somebody and say, hey, we're actually good at what we do? What, what message does that send? I think you're not. <laughs> well, first of all, does it put you in a positive light no. in the person that's buying something from you? It actually makes you look like you are petty and that you're attacking other people. That's not, anybody, any, a great salesperson knows, don't ever attack your competitor. If you position, you can position them without having to say a single word. Those guys at Cordell and Cordell, they do a great job. They do a great job. It's just people that have a higher net worth demand different things, and that's why we exist. Well, what are those things? Well, it's interesting that you ask that. Now we can talk about being good. Well, um, we have special estate planning attorneys because if you're worth more than $10 million, you have to have a Q-tip trust instead of a living trust, right? Simple things like this. How do different verticals apply this? Like construction, right? I mean, it's an interesting, specialization obviously is, is one way, right? Or law firms, specialization, you talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, just thinking about how to, so even if, let's say healthcare was your contractor and healthcare is one of your industries, right? Mm -hmm. How are you separating yourself from, and they're dealing in a marketplace that is price driven, RFP, put it in there, but somebody's winning those, and yeah. somebody, like, how are we separating our business? What can they do? How do they start thinking outside the box to be different? So first of all, if you're, um, I don't know how many times I've told you, well, if, if we don't, we are in a price driven business. And if we don't get the price right, we won't get hired. Well, this is something we've been measuring for almost a decade. And guess what? If price was the most important thing, guess what you would be? There's a word. Who knows what that word is? A commodity. You'd be a commodity. And if you were a commodity, you wouldn't have a job. You'd be traded up on a board somewhere. <coughs> You're not a commodity. It is a chump ass excuse for not working and figuring out why your customers matter and why they're doing business with you. Because if it was price, you wouldn't, your, your job wouldn't exist. And by the way, we, we measure that. It's never been number one ever. Actually, most of the time we find that when someone insists that we have to get the price right, we, we have a skill of relativity that we measure these things. Price is almost always towards the bottom. Is that consistent across industries? The only one I've seen that's absolutely consistent is banking. And that's when price essentially is an interest rate. So the closest industry I've ever measured is the mortgage business. That's the closest to a commodity I've ever seen. So if you're in the mortgage business, that sucks. <laughs> Creating differentiation is not that hard. We just did it. Like, was that hard? We have to go to school for that. I mean, I led you there a little bit, but it's not, it's not challenging. We don't need friggin' MBAs to do that. All you gotta do is, the reason it was easy is because you have to, you're separated from it. It's not your business. When it's your business, it's really hard to have perspective on anything. So cr just coming up with an idea that, um, that can resonate with someone emotionally is can be as simple as having a specific person on staff. Like, um, let's say that you are, uh, let's say that you are a software company, and you, you sell software to public schools. 
and you can hire staff just like everybody else. You can hire sales staff. So what if, what if you only hired for your sales staff X principles? Is that an emotional differentiation that you can make over everybody else and gives you the ability to like, like do you have instant credibility? What if they all got fired and they were criminals? Irrelevant variable. Your message is we only hire X principles. So like immediately you have generated objective and emotional connection with someone. Did you have to say quality? That's what will be inferred. Holy crap, they know what they're doing. What if the principals know absolutely nothing about software? Is that a relevant variable? No. You can always have the technician come in from behind. It's really not that hard. Anyone else? Cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah, it's a good one, I can tell. So, uh, i.e., let's say that you are going after same product or variations of the same product, and you're going into three different markets. Well, what you have to figure out is, is there actually a commonality that exists between those two marketplaces? We call it an umbrella concept. So um, is, there, is there something that you say that will resonate with both of those marketplaces? Now, there will almost certainly, those are two completely different, and that's a B2B versus a B2C market segment. There are going to be so many variances there that it may actually make sense for you to create two different brands, right? It just depends on, it just depends on what the, like, you should be, if you aren't talking to your customers now to some extent and gathering qualitative data, you're losing money, like, like right now. Like, go talk to your freaking customers. You don't need somebody like me to come in and do a fancy pants measurement. You'd be shocked if you take like five people to lunch, how much you'll learn. And just be dumb. Be the dumbest person in the room. Like for John, it's like real easy. And, <laughs> and you will be shocked at what you will learn. But you're, you're, in a, you're in a tough situation because you, what's an OEM have in common with an end user? Probably not a heck of a lot, right? So in, in that particular instance, like having two different brands could be on the table. But you gotta understand what the hell they want, otherwise what are the brands? You just come in two random names. But the most important thing you can do is find an umbrella concept. Are, is there something that we are selling or providing that generates the same objective emotion between this group in this group. That way at least gives you like a basic lead that you can go out and then you can have like sort of different sub points. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. You only have to go as far down the tree branch as the market. So for instance, we could go a uh, divorce attorney for men who have kids and a uh, net worth of uh, $10 million who only drive Maseratis. We could do that. But it wouldn't make sense to, right? Only in the event the market will dictate how specialized you need to be. Well, I think that's like trying to understand the client's perspective, right? So know your clients. Like if you know their pain, then you can start to create those differentiators. Like we know what people have been selling in our industry. So sometimes you change your perspective to understand what your true differentiator is. And like if you don't know that, you don't talk to your clients, you don't understand. Yeah, what you do. What you do is irrelevant. It's a very hard reality that you need to come to if you want to run a successful business. The thing that you do all day long, the widget you generate, the transaction that happens is an irrelevant variable. If you think like that, you will start advancing your company forward in a positive way.